From the JAMA Network, this is JAMA Cardiology Author Interviews. Conversations with authors exploring the latest clinical research, reviews, and opinion featured in JAMA Cardiology. Hello, and welcome to the JAMA Cardiology Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kristen Patton. I'm a professor of medicine in the electrophysiology section at the University of Washington and an associate editor for JAMA Cardiology. Today's guest is Dr. Jag Singh, a friend since our fellowship days, a professor of medicine at Harvard, and the founding director of the Resynchronization and Advanced Cardiac Therapeutics Program at the Massachusetts General Hospital Heart Center. Welcome, Jag. I am so excited to have you on the program. Chris, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. I am delighted to be chatting with you on this topic. And, you know, having done fellowship together, this is like a full circle moment for us to be chatting. So very excited. Thank you. It really is. And today we're going to be discussing a study that we in EP have been waiting for so long for, the results of the SOLVE CRT pivotal trial, which looked at the safety and efficacy of the WISE CRT system. This is a tiny ultrasound-based device implanted directly into the endocardial left ventricle for CRT. And Jack, since this is such a really novel, very interesting device, before we get to the study, can you start us off a little bit with some of the background and history and development of how the YCRT program came to be? Sure. So in terms of background, Chris, I think it's important for the listeners to know that cardiac resynchronization therapy is a very well-established strategy for treating patients who have heart failure and have ventricular dyssynchrony. Now, as good as CRT is, it's not always successful. I mean, 30% or so, you're not able to put the lead in the right place, or it's unsuccessful to get the left ventricle lead into the coronary sinus. And there are also many challenging patients who are high risk with ICD upgrades who might have venous occlusion or are predisposed to infections. And in these situations, it was thought that you know, is there a way that we can circumvent the constraints of the venous anatomy and in these high-risk patients? And that's where I think YCRT really kind of finds a role. And taking up on your question, this device allows for a leadless implantation of the left ventricular electrode into the LV endocardium. And then, interestingly enough, that electrode is stimulated by ultrasound energy that gets converted to electrical energy and paces the heart. So if you look at the WISE CRT system, it has a co-implant device. So all these patients actually have an existing device that can pace the right ventricle. Then there is the receiver electrode that is implanted in the left ventricle endocardium. And then in the subcutaneous space, you implant a battery that actually makes the transmitter generate the ultrasound energy that hits the electrode and gets converted to electrical energy. So that's a balcony view of how the device operates. There are many nuances to it, but it works pretty well to circumvent some of these constraints that I talked about. Absolutely. And for our listeners who can't see our fingers, can you tell us how big this device is and how you thought about developing it with respect to concerns that maybe having something permanently in the left ventricle might increase the risk of thrombus or stroke? Yeah, no, absolutely. So this is in length, nine millimeters, 9.7 millimeters. Wow. And in width is about 2.3 or 2.6 millimeters. So it's really tiny. When you implant this with the delivery system into the left ventricle, it actually gets impinged into the endocardium and then gets endothelialized very quickly. So the risk of thrombus from this device is actually minimal to negligible. And so that's one of the advantages of being so small that it gets completely encapsulated by the ventricular endothelium itself. So that's the advantage. You know, people in the past had tried to put left ventricular leads directly into the endocardium. It was the Alsing study. And that had a problem because the electrode inside the left ventricle then had the propensity to develop thrombi and clots and interfere with the mitral valve. And this way, the leadless electrode really circumvents all those problems. So great. And so once you had the system working so effectively, how did you think about what patients you wanted to include in a trial for the device? Yeah, so this trial, the SOL CRT trial, had went through some changes. And as you read the paper, you'll figure those out. But initially, it was started as a randomized trial where we decided to randomize patients who got the device and turn on the device versus turn off the device. And during COVID, 
this trial got modified a little bit, but I'll come back to that. The, the intention of the trial was largely to use this in patients that previously were untreated by CRT. That's number one. Uh, and that's because they had a failed implant or they couldn't get the coronary sinus, that is the LV lead in the right spot along the epicardial surface. The second subset of patients who were really high risk and you didn't want to do a conventional CRT in them because they were high risk and they had venous occlusions or had a high risk for infections. And the third part of the study at that point in time when the randomized version was in play were non-responders to CRT. So people who did not respond to conventional CRT can you put a leadless LV electrode in another region of the heart that might resynchronize the heart and translate into better outcomes in these patients? Now, we had recruited about 108 of the 350 patients and then COVID hit and we had to modify uh, the protocol alongside the FDA and then made the remaining part of the protocol a prospective, non-randomized, unblinded follow-up study the way we recruited another 75. So we had a total of 183 patients who were a part of the safety and the efficacy analyses for the SALT CRT study. So initially the randomized group, everyone gets an implant and then the randomized to pacing on versus pacing off. And then that second group after COVID was all pacing on unblinded. Exactly. And the procedure itself, you know, EPs have gotten so skilled at um, being able to do transeptals and being comfortable maneuvering in the left ventricle. Do you think that the implant procedure is going to be pretty straightforward for most people? Or do you think this is going to be kind of a new, exciting challenge for us? No, that's a great question. I think certainly it's an exciting procedure. And over the course of the study, it actually evolved. So initially, when we started the study, the implant strategy was retrograde. So you went across the aorta, through the aortic valve, went to the LV endocardium, and delivered the LV electrode endocardially using the delivery catheter. During the course of the study, we started actually doing this transeptally. So you go transeptal across the mitral valve, and then hook the catheter under the valve and actually deliver the uh, LV endocardial lead. So that actually enhanced the safety of the procedure. And also most EPs are comfortable primarily with transepto yeah. delivery of the device. So really we changed the course halfway through the study and most of the devices subsequently were transeptal in their process of being implanted. Great. Um, and did you do any kind of mapping at all to figure out the best place or just go for a basal LV endocardium? Initially, there was an attempt to try to map the QLV, so really find out which part of the endocardial space was most electrically delayed. And there was an attempt by certain physicians to do that, but overall, it was largely in the basal area of the lateral wall, which was a targeted area. And that worked pretty well in terms of translating into a narrowing of the QRS width. So not every patient was specifically mapped. All right. And then maybe if you could give us some details about the efficacy and safety outcomes. Absolutely. So in terms of efficacy, our bar was set at a change in the end systolic volume of at least 16 point, oh, sorry, 9.3%. And this was based off the lower end of the confidence limit of a meta-analysis of a large number of the CRT study, right? And we were actually able to reduce the end systolic volume in the study to 16.3%. So really, it was significant in terms of uh, achieving efficacy. The safety bar was set at freedom from type 1 complications at 70% and less. And we were able to prevent complications in 80.1% of the patients with type 1 complications. So really, uh, really met the bar on both safety and efficacy. And these were all set after large and long discussions with the FDA, but worked out well. Oh, I love this. These are really terrific results. And, you know, one thing I noticed in looking at the paper is that the efficacy results were really limited to the patients who were in the randomized trial. And I just want to make the point that I think that that's really important since there's such a tremendous placebo effect when we implant devices in people or do surgeries. So I think that is really helpful in terms of putting those results into context. Help our readers a little bit. What is a 16% reduction in end systolic volume? What does that mean for people? Right. So, so this is a percent change in the end systolic volume within a patient of at least 16.3%. 
But when you break up the primary efficacy endpoint into end systolic volume, there was a decrease in the end systolic volume from about 146 to 121. Wow. There was a decrease in the end diastolic volume from 206 to 181. And if you look at the mean increase in ejection fraction, that increased from about 31 or so to 36.3%. So it was a significant increase in the mean increase in ejection fraction. Um, so all the efficacy endpoints in the prospectively followed unblinded patients, as well as in the randomized component, were all evaluated by a blinded core lab. Okay. So that, would be, that really ensured that you know there was no subjectivity to the evaluation of uh, EF later on. It's so carefully designed. I did want to touch on a little bit the safety issues. I think the paper really describes the complication risks, which are a little bit different than we think of for all transvenous devices or leadless devices. And there's also this interesting pattern where some of those risks seem to have decreased over the course of the study. Can you talk to us a little bit about how those complications differ and the sort of things you guys learned in implanting these devices? Absolutely. So I think it's important for the listeners to recognize that type 1 complications could be related to the device itself and could be related to the procedure itself. Device-related complications could be related to the delivery system, could be related to the battery or the generator or the ultrasound transmitter. Related to the device system, we had some initial issues with receiver electrode not being anchored or getting displaced. Hmm. And that's something we eventually, over the course of the study, as you alluded to, it got much safer because then we switched from using angiographic strategies alone to using echocardiography. So we could actually see how we were implanting the electrode and be sure that it was really impinged where it needed to be impinged. So the safety with respect to the delivery of the electrode actually got significantly enhanced. Initially, there were some vascular events, and those vascular events were related to groin hematomas and some retroperitoneal bleeds, and much of those were all in the subgroup that had retrograde implantations. And I think moving across to the transeptal approach really diminished the risks related to the procedure per se. And, you know, we had, a, I would say, initially a high number of perforations that actually literally disappeared towards the mid and end part of the study. And those were, again, perforations were related to the suboptimal delivery of the electrode. And once we switched to ICE, once we switched to using, uh, you know, intracardiac echocardiography uh, alongside a transeptal approach, we could safely deliver the electrode that that complication also literally disappeared. You know, it is a two-step procedure where you actually implant the battery and the transmitter, and then you implant the LV electrode. And there were some pocket events such as hematomas because you have to keep the patient anticoagulated soon after the implant. So we switched that to a two-step procedure. And then after you got experience to a one-step procedure where you did everything all at the same time. Uh, And those things also helped with these complications related to hematomas too, which were really few. There were just four hematomas in, uh, in 183 patients. But again, those are complications to be aware of. That's really fascinating. And I think it's such a great use of imaging to be able to see what you can see when you deliver. I'm surprised still about the perforations, though. Were there things that surprised you at that usually very thick basal area of the LV that would have related to some of the perforations? Or were people just not where they thought they were? Uh, I think a combination of the two. And, you know, sometimes initially without the use of ice, you're not exactly sure of how much pressure to push Mm -hmm. when you're pushing the electrode. And I think sometimes you can be overzealous with the amount of pressure because you're worried about the fact that it might get dislodged or migrate. And I think some of those judgment calls may have led to that. There has been an evolution of the guiding catheter sheet also over time. Now it's balloon tipped, so it doesn't cause any trauma to the endocardial surface. So that also prevents the potential for any perforation. So there have been advances over the course of the study. And even now, as the products are being developed, there are advances that are happening that I think have made the procedure significantly safer than what it appears within the study itself, although it met its safety endpoint even in the study. 
Yeah, that's so great. Us and the other EP listeners, um, we've all gotten really excited about the possibilities, both with respect to leadless pacemaker therapy and also uh, conduction system pacing and left bundle area pacing. And I know there's at least one case report out there using this system for LV endocardial left bundle capture. What are you seeing and thinking about for next steps in that place? So there's actually a study that is being planned right now called Access CRT in the, I think it's largely based in the UK, which is largely just looking at conduction system pacing using the leadless LV endocardial electrode. So the beauty of this system is that you can actually get into the LV, you can map the conduction system all along the septum, find the spot that you think is going to be the most appropriate one, and then deliver the electrode out there. So I think the possibility of providing individualized pacing really is taken to a different level. Yes. Because conventionally, you know, I I do a lot of left bundle pacing, and as do you, Chris. And I think some of it works well and some of it doesn't because you're kind of futzing around trying to find a spot through the right ventricle, not knowing where you're going to land on the endocardial surface of the LV. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes you land up with QRS intervals that are nowhere close to what you want them to be. Again, there's a whole learning phase with this, but I think the opportunity of mapping the endocardial surface on the left ventricle for the conduction system and then delivering it in an individualized way, I think makes it really exciting. Oh, yeah. And there are studies being planned, and I think there are a lot of centers that have done more than a few cases now. So exciting. Really, really super cool work. Are there things that you'd like to tell our listeners that I haven't touched on with respect to the study or the system? Yeah, so there's another study called the TLC study. This is for total leadless CRT. So there was this really neat, I would say, retrospective analyses of eight leadless CRTs that were done in patients who actually had an RV micro, which was there in place. So that served as the initiating impulse alongside the YCRT system. So now you have a completely leadless CRT system in patients who have atrial fibrillation and don't need an atrial lead. So that concept is now being pushed forward through the TLC study to really provide the opportunity of giving completely leadless CRT in patients with a subcutaneous array of devices so you can kind of, you know, not have to deal with leads inside the heart. So that's another cool study that's coming around the corner. Uh, Other than that, I think very exciting. The system is getting further, I would say, finessed and excited about, you know, taking it into other studies. Absolutely. I mean, it really is inspiring to think of how just leaps and bounds this sort of development has been for safer, better system delivery for patients. It's amazing. I think it fits really well with your uh, recent book that I want to mention to our listeners, Future Care, Sensors, Artificial Intelligence, and the Reinvention of Medicine. It just seems to be very much a part of this theme that you've had through the development of your career of really pushing novel and innovative work for the, the benefit of patients. I was super interested, though, when you recently gave a keynote talk at the Heart Rhythm Society meetings, how much your focus has really been on thinking about how to improve not just this incredibly detailed engineering-based innovative work in electrophysiology, but also how can we overall make the systems better for patients overall and how we're failing people in medicine in a lot of different systems. How do you combine those very disparate areas of interest and intellect. Well, thank you, Chris. I thank you for the shout out for the book. And it was probably the biggest honor of my life to give the keynote at the Heart Rhythm Society. It was, uh, you know, I think we're all working, you know, in device innovation. And as much as you do in the same arena and having worked with the FDA, you realize, you know, how much we really still need to do in ensuring that we're giving the best possible care in the most individualized form. So I think sensors and AI certainly provide that opportunity. And I think leadless pacing through the WISE CRT system also provides that opportunity of really providing individualized pacing in the future. So I know it may seem a stretch, but the idea is to really, you know, configure whatever you're doing for the exact needs of the patient rather than using conventional cookie cutter style approaches that a lot of our large population-based studies recommend. Yeah, 
Absolutely. Well, thank you for all of this work. Um, it's just really been amazing to get to spend this time with you. And congratulations to you and your whole team for persisting through and, and bringing this great new device to market. And I think we're all excited to see what happens in the future with it. Thank you so much, Chris. It's an honor to be here and so cool to hang out with you again. This episode was produced by Daniel Musisi at the JAMA Network. To follow this and other JAMA Network podcasts, please visit us online at jamanetworkaudio.com or search for JAMA Network wherever you get your podcast. Thanks for listening.